started. I am going to introduce Rob from NAX, and this is a NAX education session that we're lucky to have with us today. And I'll turn it over to Rob to introduce the other co-presenters. Yeah, thank you, um, everybody. Welcome. Thanks for the opportunity to share today. Um, uh, even though we can't see each other, we can't be in the same room. It's still real important um, that we're we're here together. So. Um, we're, we're excited to be here too. Um, this is really going to just be an, an informal chat that we hope will give you some practical ideas and um, potential solutions. Um, as we go along, if you have any questions, please put them in the chat and we'll try to get to those as they come through. Um, I'm not going to talk near as much as the other two here, but I, I wanted to convey first um, that unlike some other industries, uh, the college store industry is so willing to help each other. And we have two panelists here today that are gonna just do that or do just that. Um, Katie is, is sporting the lumber Jill look for Halloween, which I think is fun too. Um, her husband I think is lumber Jack. So she is lumber Jill, right? So that's gonna be, that's exciting for today. So if you all are dressed up, show us your face that we would love to see that too. Um, both, both Joe and Katie, they represent stores varied in different sizes. Both are ready to share what they do now and how they're being successful. So um, my, my role is just to facilitate the conversation. So as we go along, like I said, if you have any questions, just type in chat and we'll, we'll take it from there. So um, let's kind of start with some demographics so everybody understands where our panelists are coming from. Um, Katie, if you will start by introducing yourself, what you do, how many students you have on campus online, um, that kind of thing. So I'm Katie Grove. I'm from Waldorf University in Forest City, Iowa. Um, we, I'm the assistant here in the bookstore and then Carla Schaefer is the director. I have five to 600 students on campus at any given point. And then our online student is about three to 4,000. And we did outsource our MBS, outsource our books to MBS Direct. Um, and mer merchandise, supplies, and then some lab manuals that the teachers make. You're muted, Rob. <laughs> Sorry, Joe, go ahead and give us your background too. <laughs> I'm Joe Stringer and I'm from Grand Canyon University. I'm the e-commerce manager for our Lope shop. We're a campus of about 23,000 students on campus and about 85,000 online students. Um, our store, we have three stores on the campus. Uh, currently we only have one open and um, we just sell general merchandise. We don't do books in our store also. So um, as we get started, uh, we wanna talk a little bit about what the store situation was like pre-COVID um, and, and the online sales and, or whatever you wanna share. Tell us about um, your experience. I know Katie, you had an experience when you first started with e-commerce, right? Um, you had some, some kind of evolution that happened at your store. And so can you kind of describe First, what the e-commerce is that you use, the platform POS system, and tell us about that position and how it how it transformed a little bit. I think we may have lost Katie. We lost Katie. Okay, well, Joe, Katie will come back, and uh, uh, <laughs> Joe, you get to you get to start. <laughs> tell us about the e-commerce platform that you use and how where you're where you're at right now. Um, before where you were before pre-COVID. Um, okay, so um, we have a, a point of sale system called Retail Pro, and so that's not gonna that's not an easy change. So we've built everything around that. Um, when I came to GCU about three years ago, we were using the Magento uh, e-commerce platform, and I migrated us to. Um, big commerce and we have a, a middleware piece of software that um, 
the company's called Retail Dimensions, but they feed data between our Retail Pro and Big Commerce back and forth. They bring our order data down, sync our inventory, and push it back up. So, um, and and also in that piece of software, it allows us to put in um, specific e-commerce data because our point of sale system doesn't support that. So, and that and that software we put in our titles, our descriptions, our metadata, and all of that sort of stuff to, to feed that data to the website. Um, not sure what else to tell you there. We also use um, several different third-party little apps and pieces to help us along the way. We use uh, a, a BigCommerce has their own app marketplace, third-party app marketplace. So we use a, a program called sales scheduler to to plan out all our sales our online sales we do we use uh avatax to calculate all our tax and and do that monthly and we use a software called omnisend to manage our our contact lists and newsletter subscriptions um, and then we use a software called uh, cloud-based software called ShipStation that pulls all of our order data and integrates with fedex and uh, the post office and UPS. We don't use UPS for outbound, but it integrates with that as well and allows us to process all our shipments through that. Okay, great. And Katie, we lost you, but you're back. Um, I am back. Um, go ahead and talk about your experience when we first started, especially, and how that, uh, tell, tell us about your POS system and the um, <laughs> Uh, I am laughing because we don't have a point of sale system. We have a register from literally the 80s, maybe 70s, because we had to pull out an old one. Um, so when I started with Waldorf in January of 2019, they had a website. However, they did not have a gateway, which is the thing that takes the credit card information for you. Um, so that was one of kind of my first priorities was to get that all set up. So we ended up going with um, authorized.net for our gateway and kind of how to, that's kind of how we get our payments, most of them. Then we have PayPal, which is pretty easy to use. Um, our website is on ASP.net storefront. Um, and that was already in place when I got here. So that's just what I rolled with. Um, the items that they did have online were very limited in sizing and only things that we had web images from vendors. So I was able to take pictures of items that we didn't have web images of just using a white backdrop and a DSLR camera. Um, so that was a big project was putting all the inventory online. By the time I had it all online, we had our gateway up about May of 2019. And since then we've been rocking and rolling and making lots of money online. So that's fun. Because we don't have a point of sale system, we manage our inventory manually. So we literally have a Word document with graphs that help us keep track of, of the inventory. And we try to count it every two weeks. Sometimes when we're dur during rush, we get it pushed to four weeks. Um, and so that's ideally not great, but we have the student workers. We have about five federal student workers and they kind of help us count that inventory. Some of them, not all of them can count. So you'll learn that pretty quick. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, wow, that's, that's a big uh, change. With, or it's it, it, very difficult when you don't have a web system, you know, uh, appeal. Yes. And you, have, you all have web commerce, but uh, without having the attachment to the POS system, that has to be very difficult. But there are a lot of stores like that. It's not just you, I, I'm sure. So uh, right. yeah, thank you for sharing that. Um, so we have a question. Could you provide more info on how you got started with PayPal as the payment option on your site for Katie? Um, so our business office um, uses PayPal to take some payments. Um, so we just hop onto their account. They just added us as like a secondary account. So I don't have access to everything that they do, but I can 
I'll have basically I have to go to PayPal's website to capture that payment. But because of the way we set up the PayPal in our website, there's just like under payments, there was a way to add PayPal in. And then you just put your account info in there and then it kind of links up with your website. Mm -hmm. That's, I hope that answers that. <laughs> yeah. well. um, let's shift gears a little bit and let's start talking about all the things that happen now that you have had set up and you've been working on um, the various inventory to get on, get it all online and, and then COVID happens. And um, clearly lots of things changed and you had to deal with, a, deal with strategies and the way you thought about things. So can you describe to us for us a little bit about what changed, what were you doing before that you're not doing now or, or that you are doing now, you know, those kind of things. Talk, talk with us with that. Um, Joe, why don't you start? Sure. Um, I guess the one piece I should put out there, which I, I didn't in the in the beginning, was um, kind of the size of our our group. So as a as a store, we have eleven full time employees and about fifty student workers, um, and that's the loaf shops as a whole for all of us. For for my department, I have two full time employees and one student worker. Um, Pre-COVID, I had one full-time employee and two student workers. And so one of those student workers was going to come on for me full-time when he graduated, which was um, in April. And the end of March kind of is when everything went haywire for us. We closed our store and things started going crazy. Um, so my student worker I had then and my uh, both student workers, the one that was going to come on full time and, and my other one, um, their their families were concerned and didn't want them coming to work. So, you know, we had a lot of changes that happened right there. Um, I lost them for a couple of months um, while, you know, the world kind of rebalanced and figured out what's going on. Fortunately, having as a as a the size of store we were having student workers around there were student workers who wanted work uh, but it did set things back a little bit to have to get back to training and uh, and get them uh, up to speed on how to help me so it uh, it's been a rush to to try to close the gap from the sales we've lost with all the stores closed and to make everything available online prior to covid uh, online was strictly um, uh, imprinted apparel and gifts, everything that had GCU, Grand Canyon University's name on it. Uh, we were selling online as, as much as we could get it online, but all the standard school supplies and other things that the store sold, we didn't sell. So it was a push to get all those things online uh, for the first time. Um, is at the same time trying to get people trained to help to do that. So there were a bunch of changes and it, it's been pretty chaotic. I'm at a, I'm at a good spot now where um, I've got my people back and, um, and, and I still have some other people now that have been trained that can step in and help when they need to help. So that's, that's been good. We've listed basic school supplies um, and we've listed like hydroflasks few other things that, um, you know, were sitting in the store with no way to sell, but historically we haven't sold them online. It's something like Hydro Flask has a bit of a high, you know, fraud concern that people could just buy those and flip them. So um, I've been kind of against before COVID listing all that stuff online, but um, we decided to give it a go since the inventory is just sitting there and we really haven't had any issues. So I'm not exactly sure how that looks going forward, but right now there's no plan to remove all those things from the website. So it's added some things to, to my business on that side. How, how much of your inventory is online? Is it, you know, half of what you have in the store is also online or is it way more than that? It's way more than that. And the goal is to always have everything online that we have in the store. It's still, it, it's, 
it's kind of my philosophy and and I think all of ours here that we want to we want to move the product as quick as we can. I mean, that's the goal, right? Is to keep flipping the product, have as many turns as we can have. So wherever the product's moving, that's where the product goes. But okay, everything that comes into our warehouse, I work out of our warehouse. We have about a, a 10,000 square foot warehouse, about the same size of a store on the main store on campus. And so um, everything that comes into the warehouse, the store gets a size run right away and I get samples to get photos and get them online. So, yeah. And what kind of tools do you use to get them online? And, um, you know, photography, do you have somebody that you partner with or is that something you do internally? How does that work? Uh, my newest full-time uh, employee is the one that was my student worker. He, uh, he, he's photography is a, a hobby and side job of his. So that was part of why I brought him on as a student worker because I knew he was good with photography. I do have a, a photography um, room here and I brought in a, a box. The, the company is called Ordery and they do all kinds of computer automated uh, photography system. So I have a computer based photography system that has, I have a box with a 360 degree turntable in it, a light box and a camera mounted on top. And then a camera that sits out on a tripod and we can see the pictures we're taking on the computer. So for, for product photos for the website, it's pretty, it's a pretty content, uh, contained environment. You know, it's very simple. I can train my student workers to do those photos uh, where, where he comes in extremely valuable is getting all our lifestyle shots and things that we want for banners or our catalog or anything like that. Okay. And Katie, um, same kind of question. I know, I know as Joe was talking about the photography and stuff, I know that you, you mentioned that you do some of that yourself and you use other tools. Um, can you describe those? And then we'll talk about more about what's happening on your side. Totally. So for, for tools that I use, um, when I'm putting together like our Instagram posts and things like that, I typically use Canva. There's a lot of free options. It's really user-friendly. Um, it's quick and easy to do. And then as far as pictures, I do them all myself if I don't have web images from a vendor. So usually I'll take the pictures, get them onto the computer. And because our budget for extra tools is $0, I use Pixlr, it's P-I-X-L-R for editing. Um, and then I typically can photo edit out the background. So it literally looks like a web image. Um, little time consuming, but during COVID, I had all the time in the world. <laughs> Great. Okay. So uh, we had a couple, cu couple questions that Joe answered. Let's talk a little bit about Waldorf um, and how you, um, how you changed what, what's different now that COVID's going on, what'd you do before all that? Yeah. So since COVID hit, well, we added curbside pickup and in-store pickup as an option. Um, we've seen a good amount of traffic with that since we opened and had kids on campus since September. Like we will have aunts and uncles that want to send presents to their students. So they order it online and then they press um, pick up in store and then their student comes and picks it up and gets it. So that's kind of a nice way to, you know, do a little something extra for the students. Um, during COVID, we ran a 19% off discount um, for pretty much any online order just to kind of drive sales. And that really did help because I think with us as a school, we don't do a lot of discounts um, on items or special prices. Our prices are what they are. And then when we do have discounts, it's because our home team game of any sport did really good. And there's a bunch of different rules that we kind of have around that to make it like legit. And we've worked with coaches kind of figure out what kind of thing, like for basketball, if you hit a three pointer, you get 5% off. So for every three pointer they hit, they get 5% off. And then that maxes out at 30%. 
yeah, that's about it. So um, when you guys are talking about or are thinking about strategies online, how did your, how did you change your mindset on getting things online? I mean, Joe talked about most everything is online. Katie, what did, did you put everything, is everything online or is it, um, you know, what is it that you put online? So everything except for supplies. Um, so pretty much anything that says Waldorf that we have in store and that I have more than two of, I put online. So let's say I have five sweatshirts in one size. I'm only going to put like two or three, depending on how well I think it'll move through in the store. Okay, great. Um, do you guys market gift options? We haven't. That's definitely something that we're gearing towards. We want to start that up in spring semester and do kind of like a goodie basket with, because we do have candy in store and other fun things um, and do something like that or a back to school basket and get those photographed and put on line with a description. And yeah, that's my projects on my weeks that I'm not in store. <laughs> and Joe, you, you do put market your gift options there online? By gift options, what do you mean, Rob? Um, gift product, it's a question in the chat. Um, gift product, I'm assuming. Um, um, uh, I, I was just... thinking more like when Katie had mentioned um, aunts and uncles sending gifts, that type of, are you marketing out to family members? Um, to say, hey, you can't visit campus, but you can send a gift so they remember you? We haven't specifically um, tried to market to that, but we, we do mail, we do have lists for all the different groups. And, and part of that is parents of ground students, par parents of online students. And so uh, we've, generally we don't target ground students um, and their uh, well, we do their families, but we don't target ground students online. One thing we've changed since COVID hit um, is we've also included them in all of our marketing. So uh, the people who may not be comfortable going into the store are still seeing all that stuff, seeing what's going on and have the option. We've always done in-store pickup um, and we don't, we haven't marketed. I just haven't had time really to try to figure out gift options as far as wrapping or presentation or any of that sort of thing and in three years I've gone from a site that was doing about 200,000 a year to the trailing 12 months now we've crossed the million mark so I've you know I've been going crazy with just keeping up and doing new things that are um, uh, that are trying to build the business that I haven't really focused on the to me, that's a smaller thing. Like it's a great option, but I don't see it generating a bunch of business for us. We certainly still have a lot of, like Katie mentioned, I think we definitely have an uptick even without us doing anything for that, where I'm seeing in the order notes that, uh, you know, this is a gift for this student, they'll pick it up because um, we do in-store pickup. And so we'll, if they leave a note that's anything personal, we'll copy that in so that it shows up on the packing slip when the when the student comes to pick it up and they'll see what they had to say. Okay. And while we're talking about um, the way that you're marketing and having the lists with uh, for email or uh, or whatever, um, let's talk about the promotions that you're doing. Um, Katie mentioned some of them with sports um, and you know, what types of platforms are you using? What kind of social media is happening? You know, that kind of thing. So we generally we've done about, we do about one kind of big promotion a month. And uh, we work with our marketing department who has lists of all the different groups. Some of the, some of the sales are targeted. If it's um, around graduation, it'll be targeted towards, towards them and alumni um, you know some are some are targeted but most of them are just general so we're sending these messages out to everybody once a month with COVID hitting you know we've tried to throw in some extra things we did a 
Um, we did a lot bigger deal around spring graduation and around graduation just in October that, um, that offered, I think we offered 25% off for a week of all alumni products and our uh, diploma frames, which generally that's really the big deal to, to the graduates because generally we don't, we don't do a discount on the diploma frames. So it's kind of a special, put it in front of them, entice them to come and, uh, and, and give them something special because they don't get the whole normal graduation experience. Um, in the middle there, we also did a, a sale that was, for, you know, work at home sale. We took a picture of a guy sideways at a table with his, with his basketball shorts on and a work polo, you know, so get your work at home apparel and we did a sale on shorts and polos uh, for a week. So we've tried to throw a few extra things in there with COVID to, to drum up all the business that we can since, um, you know, since the stores closed. Um, we, um, do you want me to talk about brand ambassadors now? Is that uh, yeah, let's hold, let's hold for a second. Let's, let's okay. have Katie answer right. um, sure. about promotions and social media. Cause I know you're trying a couple things in, in social media too, right, Katie? Yeah, so we actually just made a TikTok account today. Um, I have, <laughs> I know, we got to get on the trend while it's there. Um, I have some student workers who are pretty savvy on the TikTok side of things, so that should be interesting. I know that they are pumped to do some dances. Well, that's it. That's super exciting because when we first had this um session for Ohio a couple weeks ago, you were like, yeah. I'm not real sure if we should do TikTok, but already two weeks later, we're like, okay, let's do TikTok. So that's cool. Right. Yeah. yeah. We pretty much just kind of roll by the seat of our pants. <laughs> um, other than that, we use Instagram. We definitely get our younger clientele on that, more of the students base. And then we use Facebook, which we get a lot of like the alumni and kind of a little bit of the older crowd. So that's really helpful. Um, and we do also have a Twitter. I don't know that we get a lot of stuff clicks from that, but I do feel like we, because we have a Twitter account, I'm able to go on and like comment and tweet at the team, sport teams that are playing and tell them like, congratulations, great game and things like that. And so then I can kind of get, um, usually get people looking at the bookstore stuff from that. Mm -hmm. And how, how have, how, how has the response been on um, those types of promotions that you're doing either email or social media? Totally. Um, they've been pretty good. Again, we don't discount very often. So when they see that there's a discount, they're pretty pumped about it. Um, before COVID, we had not had a discount online before because of shipping costs and we don't want to, you know, lose money on shipping costs and lose money by discounting a product. So once we got our shipping progress figured out between UPS WorldShip and then we do USPS through Pitney Bowes, um, everything's pretty accurate through our website. So we were able to add that discount and luckily we had had that all figured out before COVID hit. Yeah, right. Okay, so um, we've mentioned student employees a lot. Um, let's let's go back into uh, what experiences or what have you experienced as far as far as a challenge with your students and or staff with um, with COVID and everything. And um, Katie, we'll start with you, and then then for sure we need to talk to Joe because he's got a cool ambassador program we need to talk about. Yeah, so we have five student workers. Um, we've got two soccer players, a volleyball player, a cross country girl, and a, what we call pillars, where it's like a, they're, they get good grades and they help in the community type thing. Um, so we have a wide variety of students. None of them have had to quarantine yet, knock on wood. Um, and our case numbers on campus are staying relatively low right now. I think we only have three active cases. So everything's been pretty good here as far as student workers. I will say some of them need more 
redirecting than others, but I think that's, you get that wherever you go. Right. And um, there, go ahead, Joe, you can talk about your students as well and how, how that's all working out and talk about your brand ambassador program for sure. Sure. Um, well, the, the students, things have, things change all the time through this. So it's been uh, initially, um, I told you, you know, the two students that I had uh, couldn't come in because their families weren't okay with it. Um, and so, you know, you've got that aspect of outside forces and, and you've got our internal policies and um, all of that at play. So um, it, it's, it's changed all along the way. Um, we have a, a hotel on the campus has become the quarantine area. Um, I, we don't have, it's not been huge. I think, you know, we've got 23,000 students. I think we have somewhere in the 90s of people that have COVID that are quarantined in the hotel. Um, those are the last numbers I heard, but um, it, things change like a couple of days, uh, just, just the end of last week or the beginning of this week, one of our students uh, tested positive. So then through contact tracing, we lost five more. So in a day, um, you know, six of our warehouse employees were just gone. So we're scrambling to figure out who else can fill those spots and uh, how are we going to make it work. Um, and this week was a big sale for us. So that that just amplified that. So, so we're... Um, we're improvising wherever we have to to get things done. It's changing all the time. When it started, our student workers were, we were told that they were considered essential employees because of our business here. Uh, when everybody came back on campus, they decided that no student workers would be considered essential anymore. So basically what that meant to, to our school was that if you had um, if you were considered essential and you had been exposed somehow, but didn't have any symptoms, you could still work taking extra, some extra precautions. But, um, but as we saw with the students we just lost, it didn't matter if they had had contact, they're no longer considered essential. So just very limited contact means they've got to quarantine and go through the whole process. So we've lost them for two weeks. Um, we have, what, talking about the brand ambassador program, this has been huge for us. And this is what we do for, for our social media. They manage our social media. We let students manage that. Uh, obviously we're, we're overseeing that, but we let students manage it. So this year we have a group of 13 students that, um, that were brought on as brand ambassadors and they sign an agreement and have some things that they have to do. They have to post every week um, on our, uh, on our uh, Instagram account. That stuff gets also put onto Facebook and they have to post on their story once a month, I think. And that, um, so that generates a lot of traffic. Also the initial, the initial application process is like every gets a whole big buzz to begin with. So that's a real neat time too. So, and these kids are, it's really pretty neat. We just did it. We're doing a catalog. So we're doing a bunch of lifestyle photos and the brand ambassadors. Part of their job also is to be available for us for product photography and to do lifestyle photos for the catalog. And so when, when, uh, when my employee was out taking photos of them, he said, uh, everybody knew him. Like, he, he's like, it's hard to get photos done because everybody's like, hey, you, you, you know, so, so they're, they're, they're famous on campus. And, Obviously, we're choosing people who who are very social, love to be online, and um, and they're they're getting that out for us. So that's been a great, a real great program we've been doing. I think for three years now, and it's just grown, and and grown our uh, followers and all of our online content a lot there. And we should say that um, Joe has given us the brand ambassador application process document which we'll share with Robin so you can uh, receive all of that information. We do have a question that says, that asks, um, do the brand ambassadors receive any specific compensation? They do. Um, so 
they they get some uh they we don't pay our brand ambassadors but they get a discount in the store um sometimes they get some free merchandise like for the catalog we we got a lot of sample things that we were able to photograph so things that were sample and stuff they were able to to take some things they wanted so they get some benefits that way um we don't really if if you see the brand ambassador agreement we send out you'll you'll see what we all that's outlined in that and and we're happy to share that but we don't promote that um uh, we promote that there's some discounts and some benefits but not exactly what those things are to everybody because we don't want to put our brand ambassadors in a situation where everybody's asking them to take advantage of the benefits they have uh, for them because that would be a bad situation for all of us so yeah great Okay, well, um, I'm definitely opening it up to the chat if if people want to ask more questions. There is a, a question that I um, skipped and I noticed that I skipped it. So I'm going to go back to it. Um, how much of the online commerce creation process was do it yourself? And how much of it was reliance on internal external expertise? Could you comment on um, on that based on your experience? I'll start. Um, so the website being built and set up was done by our IT department. Um, but pretty much after that, everything else is like a do it yourself for us here. And Katie, you're, I mean, having no POS system, it's a it's a real do it yourself. <laughs> sure is. <laughs> Good times. Uh, can you kind of describe what what that means? Um, yeah, so we do. So basically, we have a whole binder that has a picture, a description, a price of every single item that we have. Um, and then basically, Anytime I have time for our student workers to go through the store, they go through and they count both our backroom inventory and our on sale, our sales floor inventory. I go through every other week and try to update that inventory manually. So I have to go in, manage the variants and the sizes and stuff that we have and individually type each time. Um, yeah. That's a, that's a lot of work. And those students, like you said, they learn how to count pretty quickly. <laughs> yeah, most of them. Some of them still struggle, but okay. we love that about them. And Joe, what about your response to the question? How much of the online creation was do-it-yourself? How much of it is reliance on the internal or external expertise? When I came on about three years ago, uh, we were using uh, the Magento e-commerce platform and that was hosted internally here on a Linux server and managed by um, our IT department here. But we were also, because there was nobody that, that understood that platform well enough, we, were, we had a contract with an outside company that, uh, that was managing that they would uh, fix things, do whatever we needed done. Um, there were concerns when I got in about the security of that system and that platform and the version we were using was um, uh, was at its end of life. So we were going to have to upgrade the cost through that external company to do that was about 20 grand. So when I heard that, it's like, we've got to look for this this doesn't make any sense so um so i ended up migrating us to a big commerce and that's cloud-based they manage all the pci compliance that's all guaranteed and secured by them so we don't have to concern ourselves with with that liability and payment processing and um it, it, I, I've set up everything with that as far as the front end of the store, the, the, the template, the design, um, all of that. We still have uh, the outside company that manages that middleware that connects with our point of sale system and big commerce. Um, so that's the only outside contact we have right now is that company that 
um, updates that and fixes problems for me periodically. And that's a that's an annual subscription based program. Otherwise, um, otherwise I'm doing whatever needs to be done. Mm -hmm. There's a couple questions on here about um, just wanting to know what your website is, what your Instagram handles are. Um, and when, when Robin sends out the document to follow up this um, presentation, there's uh, most of that I think is included in that. I, I don't think I put the Instagram handles, but you all can um, share that if you wouldn't mind. And we'll get that. And I'm assuming that there are links on the websites to their social medias. Yes. Yep. Um, our website is lopeshops.gcu.edu. And GCU Lope Shops is our Instagram. And Katie? Our website is waldorfbookstore.com. And our Instagram handle is Waldorf University Bookstore. Okay, it doesn't look like we have any more questions in the chat, but um, before we wrap up, um, I have one last question for you all. Um, what would you say would be one best practice for e-commerce that you'd recommend to everybody? Um, my biggest recommendation would be to manage your inventory well, because I hate going to a customer and being like, mm, sorry, we actually sold out of that. Just, I hate it. Because then they're sad, but usually we find them something else. And typically I can convince them to get more because they're like, oh, I didn't know you had that because I maybe only had one of it in the store. So it works out in the end, but it's definitely a struggle. Great. And Joe? Um, you can always quickly Google and find all a pile of things for e-commerce um, best practices as far as managing your site, managing your inventory, um, search engine optimization, all the things you need to, to worry about on your site, analytics and how to use those. Um, the thing I would say, especially as I talk to so many people in the, in the college industry and how um, how challenging and broken pieced together systems are. Um, the, the thing I try to focus on all the time and I, I would encourage you to do is, uh, is always look for ways to improve just your daily processes. How can you automate anything you can do? Um, looking for other solutions that you'd be able to implement that will save you time, save you effort. Um, you know, we use in, in all of our shipping, we use a software called ShipStation. It integrates with FedEx, UPS, the post office. When we, um, when we go to ship something, it has a best rate option. So we can compare all those different, all the different prices from those different accounts. And, and we offer, we ship through FedEx, we ship through the post office, but um, we also then I put standard shipping prices online where it just says five to seven business days and we choose which way it's gonna go out. So that best rate comes in real, comes in very handy for us to figure out which way can we send it out that's gonna be the best deal. Um, and I said yesterday or day before in another conference, we just a, this last week I was out shipping again. I've been away from that for a while, stuck in my office just managing things and I'm out there shipping and I look at my thermal label printer and I realize it's got a peel off option that we're not taking advantage of that will peel the back off the label and let us throw it right on the package. And every time we're tearing off a label, peeling it off, putting it on, throwing the back out, just little tiny things like that for us. I mean, that's saving, I don't know, three to five seconds of package on, you know, a hundred packages a day that adds up to time that we can focus on something else. So just in everything you do, just look for those little things that can, can, can uh, buy you some time back. Yeah, that's good advice. Uh, we do have one question in the chat. Um, how do you maintain a uniform look to the website and social media with a lot of people managing it? Do you have a policy or theme they have to follow? 
at Waldorf, we do not. I am the only one posting. So everything kind of is cohesive and looks the way I see it in my head. So <laughs> that is nice about being a small school. Uh, we don't really have a lot of people managing it. So uh, I manage everything on the website and um, and I've kind of created templates, the fonts we're going to use, all the different things we're going to use in our middleware that loads stuff from our POS, um, uh, pushes everything up there uniform. So I manage the theme. Nobody else touches that on the website. And as far as social media, although we have all the brand ambassadors involved, you know, they they have uh, monthly meetings with uh, with our assistant director, and they you know they they understand what the expectations are of them and what those things need to or what things they shouldn't be doing at least, um, and 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 they understand the purpose of what they're doing and 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 the goals set for them. So. Everything is managed basically that gets online either by myself for the website or our assistant director for the social media. It's that's that's where it stops. So, well, this has been a lot of information. Um, I, I think we all appreciate the insights um, uh, shared by our panelists. I I hope it's been helpful to those in the audience today, and. Um, Unless there's any other questions that pop up in the chat, I want to say on behalf of the panelists and Max, thank you for having us. We really appreciate being here and hopefully this was helpful to you. Thank you, Rob, Joe, and Katie. Thank, thank you. you.